It was once called King Cotton. I'm not so sure it's king on the agricultural list anymore in the South, but you can still find plenty of cotton fields around Memphis, very close to downtown. It is still picked, loaded on barges, and floated down the Mississippi as it was 100 years ago. Well, I'll tell you what, these guys are loaded for bear right now as they are formed up for heat number three. And believe it or not, Steve, five out of the seven drivers in this field are from right here in the Memphis area. Remember, we said this is a weekly show that they run here. This is, of course, a special outlaw program, but uh, Jim Bowden and Kenny Conrad on the front row are from right here in Memphis and West Memphis, right across the river. So only two other drivers, Robbie Stanley out of Brownsburg, Indiana, and Chris Heesh in the 17E from Woodbine, Maryland. They got to go against the locals, and I think the locals have got an advantage right now. Well, one local has certainly jumped out there, the number 29 car of Jim Bowden. Jim Bowden right here in Memphis, Tennessee. Right behind him, the nine car, Kenny Conrad, West Memphis, Arkansas, just across the river. And a terrific battle for third place. That's between Craig Honda and Robbie Stanley really going at it, Steve. And Brock, as you said before, this appears to be a pretty good two-lane racetrack, down low and up high. Here's the fight for the second spot, number three, Craig Hodden, and he's going to take second, has got it from number nine, Kenny Conrad. Good race. Uh, that 1X, Eddie Gallagher in the white 1X uh, moved up there. Couldn't quite hang on, so he is sitting back there right behind uh, Hodden. As they sailed on the front straightaway here at Memphis, 29, Jim Bodden leads it. Right behind him, number three, Greg Hodden, and a 1X of Eddie Gallagher. Oh, going at it. Gallagher now takes a move and moves by Hodden. Now watch Gallagher. He'll go up high and try to put that drive wheel right on the edge of the cushion there where he can find some traction. So as we saw, the local boys dominating right now, but that could change because the 17 in the yellow car, Chris Easter, has just moved by out and the 29 to take over the third spot, Steve. So that's going to give him a transfer position if he can hang on to it. 29, Jim Bowden has hit the wall, but he keeps on going. These guys are pretty durable. It might survive a little wall banging incident like that. Well, it hurt him badly, though. It drops him out of that top five and brings the caution flag out. And uh, the field will reform with Eddie Gallagher leading it right now. So as the field rolls around under caution earlier, Steve had a look at the scoreboard here at Memphis. There's a few dirt tracks around the country that have electric scoreboards, but they're usually pretty simple affairs. Maybe you can display all oh, the top three or four positions in a race. Here at Memphis International, they have the most advanced and sophisticated scoreboard we've ever seen at a circle track. It can show you up to 22 positions in a race, so the fans always know what's going on. It's got, boy, that's incredible. I'm, I'm doing fine, sign. This thing's even a little more sophisticated than I thought. Holy sm Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, it can do a lot of things, cartoons and all kinds of graphics, and all in all, it just adds a lot of fun and information to the night for all the fans. How did it know I was down here? <laughs> the sign knows everything, Evans. As Eddie Gallagher leads him down the back straightaway, still under caution, and we've got five laps left in this heat, and I think we're going to see a green. Eddie Gallagher on the gas and goes up high, and that may be a mistake. No, he hangs on to it, makes it work. Gallagher likes it up there. He sure does. That uh, white number one X is working real well on the high side here at Memphis. As the number three car, Greg Hodden, still holds on to second place, but will be challenged, I think, in the next couple of laps by Chris East, who's come from all the way in the back of the field. Right now, East, down low, tries to get by him, can't make it work. Hodden holds on to the second spot, down into turn number two. Off turn three, there is East in that 17A in the yellow car, right behind him, falls back a little bit down the back straightaway. So Hodden answers the challenge, and Chris Eason seems to be able to hold him off right now. And you think of the height that it takes a long way around. Well, certainly it is, but if you get down too low, you're scrubbing off so much speed, you lose that momentum you need. Well, I also think there's a little advantage for Greg here, and there's that uh, orange number three. He is a local driver, runs here regularly, and can pretty well read this racetrack probably a little bit better than Chris can. And that comes down to tire choice, gear choice, uh, all those little subtleties that make a race car work on a half mile like this. Number 57, Robbie Stanley is now challenging on the outside for third. Brownsburg, Indiana, as Robbie Stanley, there's two yellow cars. There you see Stanley up high, east down low, and Stanley almost makes it work. 
white flag. We've got the final lap of the big race here is for the fourth transfer spot between East and Stanley. Right now, though, East moves out and tries to get around the outside of Greg Hodnett. Down into turn number three. East low. Hodnett high. Here they come, charging for the flag. And Hodnett holds on to take that second spot and withstands a serious challenge by Chris E. And what a run for this man. Eddie Gallagher, the 1X car, came from the very last row to win this race. Just kind of picked his way through, and as we saw, used that high line to his advantage. And also some intimate knowledge of this racetrack, because uh, like Hodnett, uh, Eddie Gallagher is a regular runner here at Memphis. So he wins in convincing style. Gallagher, Hodnett, Ish. Robbie Stanley transfers to the main. Kenny Conrad, more racing ahead of him to get there. Those are the final results of heat number three. And now let's go to Steve. Well, Memphis area fans have been watching Eddie Gallagher on these tracks for about five years now, and they give you a big hand when that checkered came out. Nice drive. Thank you. And I'm told this is a new car to you, a new engine. Yeah, everything's brand new. We hadn't had it but about two weeks. This is uh, the third night on it. What do you think of your home track tonight? Uh, I like it pretty well so far. <laughs> it was good to hear, that's for sure. You've got a good starting spot in the A-man, it looks like. Yeah, it looks like I'm going to be starting up close to the front. We'll be watching. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, Brox, for second place. With Greg Hodnett, who uh, ran a good, strong second. Greg, uh, you held off uh, Chris Eish without too much trouble, and uh, the racetrack seemed to be laying in pretty good. Yeah, it's a little slick, but you just got to find where to run. Yeah, it looks like a couple of guys are trying to high side uh, in the last few laps, but uh, couldn't make it work coming uh, off a of three and four. Yeah, it's a, it's got little pebbles coming out. It's not really much of a cushion, but there's enough there that you can get going pretty good, though. Okay, thanks. Steve? Thank you, Brock. As you know, Chris Each is really the only traveling outlaw that was in that heat race. It looked like you were a little tentative not knowing who you were racing with. Well, yeah, you know, these guys are, you know, they're kind of used to this track, and... I don't really know any of them, but uh, I think we had a little too hard a tire on it. We might have just drove right by them. I don't know. I watched that first uh, and uh, first two laps, really. You kind of looked like you were going to make a move, and you thought, nah, maybe I'll wait it out a bit. Well, yeah, I, I don't know any of these guys, so I can't really, you know, I can't really trust them. So, I mean, I'm not saying they're not bad, you know, they're not good racers, but I just don't know them. Well, mission accomplished for you. A good third place finish. Thank you. Okay. Rock. Okay, Steve, they're rolling out for the final heat race here at Memphis. We'll be back for the start right after this. In a lovely Memphis suburb, this beautiful brick home belies the fact that at the rear, the garage has been converted into a full-blown race car shop for Jeff Swindell. And here the crew prepares the machine that we'll be seeing tonight. Now, this car has several seasons of racing on it because late in the year as we are now, the logistics get pretty weird. The World of Outlaws were in California last weekend and will be in California again next weekend. So many of them have left their front line ironed out of the West Coast. Well, Steve, they're lined up and ready to go for heat number four, and we've had a little bit of a change. There are only five cars uh, out there. The sixth car of Hooker Hood, who was starting on the pole, they had to scratch that race car, so Ricky Stanhouse and Terry McCarlow move up. Jeff Swindell in that third spot. Uh, believe it or not, four out of the five guys are right here in Memphis, Tennessee. Only Terry McCarl from uh, Des Moines is, uh, is an out-of-towner. Now, this entire field is inverted. So the man to maybe keep an eye on is at the back of the pack. That is the white number 61 car, blue and white, actually, of Mike Ward. And there goes Ward. You see him, oh, and what a nice job he did in squeezing between two drivers. So the drivers to watch in this particular field, I would guess, would be the 11 car of Jess Lindell and the 61 of Ward. But right now, it's the 7X of Terry McCarl, the Des Moines driver who leads it, coming off a turn number four. Well, 61 Mike Ward just surprised 11 next Jeff Swindell by passing him on the inside for that third spot. Well, there's Ward down low in the white 61. Jeff Swindell high, and the 11 comes back to retake that spot. But here comes Ward again down the back straightaway. These two guys going at it. There is Ward. Jeff Swindell still a little bit of a lead, now falling back as Mike Ward moves out into... Oh, look at that. They almost came together going down into turn number one, Steve. But look at Swindell strike back. Jeff Swindell takes that third spot away again from 61 Mike Ward. These guys are really showing what sprint car racing is all about. As number one, Stanhouse almost gets sideways. 
sideways right in the middle of it as Jazz Wendell barrels right past him to take over that second spot. Now Mike Ward challenges Stenhouse for third. Trying to get underneath him down the back straightaway. Does he make it work? Yes. Mike Ward moves into the third spot. And Brock, this is really some stand-up action for a heat race. This is main event style racing. <laughs> it sure is. As uh, Mike Ward does continues to lead Stenhouse down into turn number one. Stenhouse hasn't given up on him, though. Still trying to hang on. But Mike Ward now opens it out about ten car lengths down into turn number three. We've got 4A Lee Brewer Jr. He is challenging Mike Ward for that fourth and final transfer spot. There they go. Ooh. Gets it loose down into turn number one. Almost hangs it up against the fence, but gathers it up again. There is Wendell moving in on 7X, the leader. He is challenging for the lead. That is Terry McCarl in the black 7X. Trying to hold off Jeff Wendell, who almost took it on the fence coming off turn four. Oh, he was about as low as you can get on this racetrack, and he's going to stay down low. He likes it there. Gets a little bit too sideways. That hurt him. Yes, it did. As uh, McCarl holds him off, down the back straightaway. But Swindell comes back at him in a turn number three. And look at this. Mike Ward moves in on both of them now. As Sammy Swindell told you earlier, the quick way around this big racetrack is keep it as straight as possible. We are on the final lap of this heat race. And look at Ward in the 61 guard trying to get under Swindell. Swindell way up against the fence down the back straightaway. Ward trying to get underneath him going into the final two corners. As they come off now, Jeff Swindell moves out. in the third spot. Terrific race. Well, Ricky Stanhouse enjoyed the lead briefly, but it turns out he is the only driver here that will not transfer directly to the A bank. Only five cars, only four transfer spots. Well, there were four Memphis drivers against one guy from Des Moines, but uh, the Iowa man held out. Terry McCarl wins it here. Heat number four in a good, strong race by all the drivers. McCarl, Swindell, Ward, and Lee Brewer transfer to the main event. Okay, we're going to take a break right now, but we'll be back with the Fram Dash, the six quickest qualifiers in our shootout, including Steve Kinzer and Sammy Swindell. Stick with us. Back in Memphis Motorsports Park, they're lining up the Fram Dash competitors, but right now, let's go to Brock Yates with the winner of Heat 4. Uh, Steve, I'm with Terry McCarl, who uh, just broke out and... Uh, held everybody off while uh, Mike Ward and Jess Wendell are beating on each other. You, uh, you had a pretty easy time of it out there. Well, it's never too easy when you're <laughs> around these guys, but uh, I got lucky. I was supposed to start in the second row, and we got to move up to the front row, so I must have had a little trouble, and uh, it helped out quite a bit. Uh, I would imagine you learned a lot about the main. Uh, how are you going to set the car up? What do you reckon it's going to be like when we, by the time we get through a few more heats and whatever? Oh, it's going to be probably just about like this. We were a little loose early on, and, and I feel like we've got the car going real well. We're going to have to start uh, quite a ways back, though, but it, it feels pretty good. I think we'll have a good chance to move up a ways. Well, it's a super job. We're, uh, we're proud of you, and we'll be watching in the main. Thanks a lot. Okay, for sure. Steve? Jeff, you don't have to be a sprint car chassis tuning expert to tell that that car was loose in a handful. Well, it is. You know, this thing's a two-year-old car. We just kind of put it together to run this this race in Syracuse. Keep having to bring our uh, other car back from California and save the trip. So, uh, you know, we're we're kind of struggling right now. But uh, you know, that, that was a good race. Uh, it looked like a main event for a minute. <laughs> well, it was pretty tight there a couple times, but uh, you know, the car was doing a really good job. But, for, for what we're doing and uh, this is only our first night out with the thing so we're getting better and better each time we go out and we're still a little off but uh, I think we're going to be in the hunt later on. I'm sure you will be. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, the field is warmed up right now, Steve, for the Fram Dash. As we said, the six quickest qualifiers here at Memphis. Uh, on the front row, Eddie Gallagher and on the outside, Bobby Davis Jr. Inside, that is Steve Kinzer in the famous number 11 automobile, the winningest driver in the history of the world of outlaws. Right beside him is Sammy Swindell. And earlier, we went over to Sammy's shop right here in Memphis. Uh, in fact, in the suburb of Bartlett, where uh, Sammy lives. And this shop, about a mile from his house, is a beautifully immaculate place. And out front, well, you can pick up a couple of sprint car souvenirs, primarily with Sammy Swindell's name on it, Steve. And the souvenir shop is like everything else that Sammy Swindell owns. Brock, his truck, his trailer, his racer, his house, his backyard, his front yard. Everything is cleaner than your doctor's office. <laughs>
I'll tell you, the days of an outlaw sprinter being run out of a gas station bay are long since past. Indeed they are. As you said, the six quickest qualifiers, the top four are inverted. So Swindell on the outside of row two may be the guy to watch. Now, as they finish the Fram Dash, so do they start the A main later on tonight. $1,500 at stake here, and also those valued starting positions. And you're riding with Bobby Davis, Jr. As they come off turn number four to take the green flag. And there is Sammy Swindell, who has already burst through the pack to take the lead away from Bobby Davis, Jr. There is Davis in the blue number 10, and down to the turn number three is Swindell riding high. Swindell is really hooked up. There is Davis sawing on that wheel as he powers down the front straightaway. And there is Swindell leading it. In fact, breaking free of the pack and charging away. In third spot is the number 11 car, Steve Kisser. There you can see Kisser right behind Bobby Davis, Jr. See Davis carrying away that plastic top high piece to keep the mud clear from his eyes. And Brock, right now, we're looking at a race for second spot between Bobby Davis, Jr. and Steve Kisser. Sammy Swindell continues to lengthen his lead here in the Bram Dash. This is only five laps of racing. There's no pacing yourself there. Oh, no, none whatsoever. And uh, there's Davis charging down to turn number three. And he is effectively holding off Kinsler back there in the third spot. So the, these three drivers have uh, immediately established a certain kind of stability in this uh, very short race. A second ago on Bobby Davis Jr.'s car, let's see if we see it again. You could see the vortex coming off of the wind on this rather humid evening. Right. Uh, there's an enormous aerodynamic effect for these big wings. As Davis takes the next to last lap, one more lap to go here. And there again, we saw the moisture coming off the right rear corner of that wing. They're actually turning air into water. You can see the suspension work here as the wing pushes down on these cars. They're only 1,250 pounds. Here comes Davis. There is Sammy Swindell to take the victory here in the Fram Dash. Davis in the second spot. Steve Kinzer just hanging on back there in that third spot. So there's your winner. Sammy Swindell earlier set the absolute track record here and seems to be in a very dominant position right now because this victory in the Fram Dash will give him the pole position in the main event. You know, as we look at Sammy's car come down the front straightaway to pick up his check from uh, the Fram people, that car is new and it is so beautifully turned out it almost looks like a model car. When you consider the beating that these race cars take on this dirt tracks around the country, this car is absolutely perfect. As there you see that uh, replica check being lined up along the right rear wheel of Swindell's car. 500 bucks to the winner. And the folks here, well, they're plenty happy. Remember, he's a hometown boy. There are your standings for the Fram Dash, Swindell, Davis, Kinzer, Ward, and Gallagher. Great show all around. But now, let's go to Steve with the winner, Sammy Swindell. Well, I'll tell you, Brock, I wish I had some kind of mutual fund that would pay off during the course of a year like the Fram Dash has for Sammy Swindell. Another winner. Yeah, well, it's been pretty good for us. You know, uh, uh, we've always seemed to do pretty good qualifying. And, um, you know, this is a little more of an incentive. And, uh, you know, we wrapped the thing up really kind of back in August. And uh, so we're pretty happy about that, you know. And uh, the way the cars run tonight, uh, you know, can't beat it. Well, the most exciting move came in the very first turn of the first lap, and you threaded the needle. Yeah, well, it was pretty close. Um, uh, you know, they kind of split up a little bit, and I started to go between them. Uh, uh, you know, the car's just working so good, and uh, Bobby moved down a little bit, and Eddie was wanting to move up a little bit, and it started getting a little tight at the end, and I was wanting to get through, and, uh, you know, I just kept it down and went through there. Congratulations. We'll let you get ready for the A main. Okay, thanks. Okay. May not be much they have to do to this car, Brock, the way it's performing. Well, Steve, I'm with Bobby Davis Jr., who uh, broke out right away and took over second, but just couldn't seem to run Sammy down. He just kind of stabilized right there and ran it out. Well, yeah, uh, Sammy, he got a good start there. Uh, I don't really know what he got going coming off of four, but uh, uh, I took over the lead there going down the front straight, and then Sammy, he got a good run going into turn one, and, uh, you know, he pulled a slip slide on me there, and, uh, you know, he caught the top first and, uh, then before I did, and uh, he, he we kind of stayed the same, but, uh, you know, he, he got a good run on that first start. Do you think that uh, that's going to be the groove for the main, uh, that up top there like you were running? Well, that's, uh, if it went nonstop, you know, and um, not too many lap cars, that's where you're going to be. And, uh, but if it gets in traffic, you know, you're going to be all over track. 
Well, it's, uh, the race car seemed to run strong. Sounded real good, and uh, you're coming off the corners good, but uh, he just got out, and he just kind of, as I say, you just kind of sat there. You couldn't, he didn't break on you, and you couldn't get moving on him. Well, that's true. Uh, we've been chasing tires all night, and uh, like I said, he got set there about two or three cars out in front of me, and uh, I didn't gain on him, and he didn't pull away, so... Uh, and he's going good, so I feel like we're going pretty good. Sure are. Well, we'll watch you in the main. Good luck. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Bobby. Appreciate it. And now let's go to Steve with the third place finisher. Well, Brock, the Knoxville Nationals champion, the winningest outlaw driver in the short history of this racetrack, Steve Kinzer, had a rather, I don't know, kind of a confused look on your face when I walked up. Like, you just maybe don't know quite what to do. Well, it's not a confused look. It's uh, it's just that we come here and uh, left both of our, our new cars out in California, and uh, we drug a three-year-old car out, and uh, we got a motor in that uh, we haven't run, and which is not running right, and I just, uh, I think we're out here running for second or third is what we're doing tonight, so. It was a frustrated look then. Well, that's uh, that's that's about the size of it. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't look like there's, uh, with the, with this car and uh, with the engine we got in it, uh, like I said, we just come here, we figured we had the point standings wrapped up. Uh, that's all we had to do show here and make a pretty good uh, running, you know, here and keep everything in the top, uh, you know, try to run the top 10 and we'd be all right. Uh, it's uh, just sort of a bad feeling when you're there and when you don't really think you got any chance of winning. So uh, that, that was probably the look you were seeing. Steve Kenzer always has a chance to win. You know that. Well, uh, I, I think we've spotted him a little bit too much tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, you could put him on one of the push trucks and he'd still be a contender. What a champion. As we watch Sammy Swindell take home that check from the Fram Dash. We'll be back. We're back at Memphis International Motorsports Park where the grid is forming for the B feature. Some people call it the B main. Some people still call it the consolation. The fact of the matter is, this is the last chance for these drivers to go to the A main where the real money is. The quick six, the top finishing six automobiles brockage, will move to the back of the A main to come. Right, Steve, and we've got a couple of uh, strong runners uh, right in those front couple of rows, including Andy Ellenberg got a broken arrow, Oklahoma, and that black number two that'll start in the third spot. But uh, all these guys, very hungry. Some of them uh, not so well financed as some of the faster uh, drivers in the field, but all working hard and trying to make their way in a very, very rugged and challenging sport. There's many a night where Kenzer or Swindell can find himself to be featured, but not on this evening. The green flag is out as they thunder down into turn number one, sweeping through into turn number two. Andy Hillenberg, the number two car, already around Kenny Conrad for second. As we watch him fly down at 113 miles an hour into turn number three. And it's Hillenberg and Hillenberg fighting for the lead here, Steve. They're unrelated. Andy Hillenberg uh, in the black two from the Oklahoma. Andy Drew Hillenberg in the 5M in that blue and white automobile in second from Indianapolis, Indiana. The number nine car, we just saw exit the picture of the yellow machine. He's in the third spot. He is followed by 24 D. Ronnie Daniels in one seat. Ricky Standout. That's the race for him. Third, fourth, and fifth. Well, those are important positions to fight for. Remember, these guys are, are trying to get into the A main or the feature event here at Memphis, Tennessee. As we watch Stenhouse and Daniels charge off her number two and down the back straightaway. And here still is that race for the second position. There is the 5M car called by the 9 car of Kenny Conrad, the yellow machine, and Ronnie Daniels at 24 d And Conrad in the number 9 car goes high, trying to get around Drew Hillenberg in the 5M down the back straightaway, and he will take over second place briefly, Steve, to work 101 miles an hour on the track. Yes, the 9 car, Kenny Conrad, is now riding in second spot and starting to pull away from Hillenberg. In the meantime, the other Hillenberg, Andy Hillenberg, in the black five. Oh, trouble in turn number one. That is Stanhouse in the number one automobile. Up against the fence, not a whole lot of damage, but I'm sure it'll bring out the caution. Oh, yeah, they're not going to take any chances at all with the car parked up. Andy Hillenberg just ran right into the rear, just grazed the rear of Terry Morgan, the 1T car, and it's cost him a left rear tire motioning to his pit crew to get a replacement ready down on the front straightaway. You know, in front, it looked to me like Morgan spun trying to avoid Stanhouse on the wall. I think that's what happened, but the big victim uh, was this man, number two, Andy Hillenberg, as he goes into the pits, certainly uh, seeking out his crew to change that tire. Let's take another look at what happened down here in turn number one. There is Stanhouse up against the wall. Boy, he got in there pretty hard. Now the power has gone away and he's just parked there. That's when the yellow flag came out. Now we'll see Terry Morgan, the 1T car, 
and no doubt had a lot of momentum, saw the car parked up there, got on the brakes pretty hard. Here comes Hillenburg to that same area. Now Hillenburg sees Morgan, but a little too late, and right there. Clips him on the left rear, and that is what caused this. This is this uh, frantic pit stop under yellow here in the pit area. That is Hillenberg still in their race car. He is uh, just uh, urging his crewmen on. They're not really geared up to do this kind of a quick pit stop. This isn't a NASCAR deal, Steve. They, uh, they don't have the kind of equipment. As you can see, it's just a regular floor jack and a very slow process to change a wheel on one of these sprinters. Well, with a sprint car, uh, you just never know what kind of parts you're going to need. You might need a whole wing. You might need a whole chassis. You might need a new driver once in a while. <laughs> This is real man's racing, and you're right. There's no way to anticipate exactly what kind of repairs might be made. All right, Andy Hillenberg back on the racetrack, obviously disappointed because he is going to start scratch at the back of the field. Tough break for him. But now, let's go back to Steve, who earlier had a look at a really bizarre piece of equipment that he ran down in the infield. We've seen some strange cars, but I think this may be a winner. Over the years, we have shown you some pretty bizarre purpose-built vehicles. Uh, the swamp buggies down in Naples, Florida come to mind. But here at Memphis in the infield, I've found a machine that rivals even those buggies. Name this beast. This is a wheel packer. Before every sprint car race, they have to go out on the wet dirt with pickup trucks and wreckers and things and pack the dirt down, right? Drive some of the water into the soil. Well, with six wheels on this custom-built beauty, it gets the job done quicker than anything else they can put out there. Now, if you're sharp, you recognize a good old Chevrolet Vega front end. And under the hood is a pretty powerful 350 Chevy engine. It takes a little power to get around the wet, wet racetrack. Now, they've got a great big wing up here. I think that's... Uh, more show than go. Now, if you're particular about the cleanliness of the interior of your automobile, this is maybe not an activity you want to get involved in. If you like good ventilation, however, this might be for you. There's no floorboard whatsoever. And I'll tell you what, as far as cleaning it, I don't think I'd take it down to the 50-cent car wars because it'd clog it up forever. Maybe a good sandblasting. What a piece. <laughs> I know some friends of mine that keep their cars clean that it just paint at the sight of one of those things. Well, I want to roll that into the Monterey Concourse de Elegance. So here. <laughs> Kenny Conrad is on the point. Ronnie Daniels behind him. We're just about ready for a restart here in the B feature. I'm Steve Evans along with Brock Gates. And at the back of the pack is Andy Hillenburg with a new rear tire. Okay, here they come off turn number four. And it is Conrad one more time in the number nine who takes the lead. But right now, Ronnie Daniels continues the challenge in the 24. Behind him, 5M, Andy Drew Hillenberg sits in the third spot now. Remember, we got two Hillenbergs in here, one from Indiana, one from Oklahoma. But the lead continues to go back and forth between Conrad 9 and Ronnie Daniels. Right now, Conrad's got a little bit of a lead, but look at this. The black two of Andy Hillenberg is continuing to challenge. That's Joey Nash sitting in the fourth spot, and 5M Andy Drew Hillenberg in third. So those three guys, the Hillenbergs, are kind of flanking for old Joey Nash as they go at it for that third spot. Well, not only does Hillenberg want to assure himself of the transfer spot, we're halfway through the B feature. He wants to start as far forward as he can in that A main. So he's really battling for position for the race to come. Yes, and he is now moved by both Nash and the other Hillenberg and hits up 118 miles an hour and got up way up on the marble. He got the left front wheel way off the ground as he jacked that race car through turn number three and four. But he is driving that thing as hard as it'll go. There's the fight for the lead. 24, Ronnie Daniels challenges and passes the number nine car of Kenny Conrad. So Ronnie Daniels now is your leader, but into the picture comes that black number two, Andy Hillenberg, charging back toward the front. Indeed he is. You can see how twitchy these cars are now. A little rubber is going down. They're starting to get a bit of traction, especially up high. And there is second, number nine, and there is third, number two, Andy Hillenberg of Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. Hillenberg is driving as if this was the A feature. Oh, yeah, he is. He obviously got his dander up when he cut down that tire and fell back. But now he moves, just cranks that automobile down low to turn number one to take over the second spot from Conrad. Well, he didn't have it for very long. Oh. And into the wall goes Hillenberg. Not hard. It, in fact, it's not even going to interrupt his pace. But he did fall back one more time. Kenny Conrad in the nine took advantage of that bobble by Hillenberg to retake the second spot. But Hillenberg right back at him again, down low, against the fence. Conrad sideways off turn number two, holds that second spot. Hillenberg though, right back at him, down low into turn number three, and he goes right on by Kenny Conrad to take over the second spot one more time, and maybe we'll make it stick this 
turn. And there is the white flag. We are on the last lap of the B feature. Andy Hillenberg in the second spot. Out in front is Ronnie Daniels. Ronnie Daniels now knows that he's got a tiger on his tail as he heads down into turn number three, off turn four. He will hold on to take the B feature. The boy that tried in the evening had to be the man in that black number two car as Andy Hillenberg comes up in second place even though he cut down a tire before even the midpoint of this race. Ronnie Daniels, he's smiling inside that 24D sprinter. He's got a right. decent starting position anyway in the A main. He does. Right here in Memphis, Tennessee, his fans are happy. And there is your second place finisher, Andy Hillenberg. Terrific race uh, here in the B feature in the Tennessee Clash. To the top six, it was well worth running. Daniels, Hillenberg, Conrad, Nash, and the other Hillenberg. Also, number 29, Jim Bowden, will all go to the A-Main event. Hooker Hood, Kyle Hale, Terry Morgan, Ricky Stanhouse, well, they are parked for the night. Brock? Steve, I'm with Ronnie Daniels, who came back uh, after that restart to win the B-Main. And I guess, first of all, we want to ask you, Ronnie, how's your shoulder? I understand you beat that up pretty good in, early in the season. Yeah, we had a little problem earlier in the year and, and damaged the shoulder twice. I heard the first time we came back and tried to race again. I believe the first race after we came back thinking it was well, we had damaged it again. Is this the longest you run uh, since then? Yes, it is. We ran a couple of uh, small quarter-mile tracks for the last couple of weeks, and getting to run this one right here is, is a pleasure. We've been waiting to get back on it and wanting on it for a long time, but this is our first race, really, for the season. You feel okay? Yeah, I think it's going to be all right. I just got to get back used to it, I guess. <laughs> Congratulations, Ronnie. Good job. Steve? Well, Andy, a sensational comeback from a damaged wheel incident. What caused that damage? We couldn't see that clearly. Well, there was a car spun out over here, and I guess uh, another guy spun to miss him. Whenever he did, he was rolling backwards across the racetrack, and I was up as high as I could go, and I just barely nicked him, so it uh, cut a hole in a tire. Obviously, you found something with the automobile since the heat race where you really struggled. Well, in the heat race, uh, uh, I'm not making excuses, but we tried a couple things, and we really thought they'd work. And the uh, car was down on the left side, and it was unhooking the right rear of the car, and uh, we just were, everybody, they just outrun us. <laughs> car appeared to be awfully loose coming out of two. You'd get up against the wall and have to get out of it. You tried to go down low. Did it work there? Uh, not really. It's, the racetrack's slick all over. There's a little bit of dust uh, up in the top down here in uh, three and four. But as far as after that, it's pretty much slick everywhere. Thanks for a great show. Okay, thank you guys. Okay, Andy Hillenberg and uh, 23 other of the quickest drivers in the world are getting ready for the A main here at Memphis International. But I'll guarantee you things are going to warm up a whole lot right here as 24 of the fastest, hardest riding race car drivers in the world get ready to go at the Tennessee Clash. A main and the folks are on their feet. The traditional four abreast outlaw starts coming down the front straightaway. Folks really love that, Steve. Oh, yeah, well, for years I've been lobbying with the outlaw officials to start the race like this, but the driver said if I did that one more time, they were going to pitch me over the wall. That's right. So up front, Sammy Swindell, Bobby Davis Jr., two local drivers, two of the best. And Steve Kinzer, Mike Ward in the second row. So we're going to have a bunch of folks going at the lead right away. Remember, we saw Andy Hillenberg. He'll start up front. Dave Blaney was run so well. He's going to start back a little bit. Jeff Swindell in row seven. He's got some work ahead of him to get up among the leaders. But Terry McCarl, Greg Woolley, they ran well in the heats. So, yeah, they're spread. Good drivers are spread throughout this field, Steve. And Steve Kinzer may be in an old used car, but if he can finish all in the top ten or so, he will clinch yet another outlaw world title. Absolutely. Uh, just as we said earlier, the winningest driver in the history of sprint car racing, and uh, many, many people feel the finest driver of all time on the dirt. Bobby Davis Jr. trying to get comfortable in that machine, making sure for one last time that he is belted in as tight as is possible. As so tight that it hurts. That's right. Now they're back down in that two abreast formation, which is the traditional starting formation, down the back straightaway from our high camera, heading down into turn number three. Swindell and Davis, number one and number ten, will lead them off the corner. The green is out, and we've got a start. A perfect start for the black of the one car, Sammy Swindell. Bobby Davis Jr. goes low. Steve Kinzer goes high, may get around Davis for a second. No, he does not. He did not hook up up there. Bobby Davis Jr. holds on a second, and uh, right now, though, go trying to go underneath Sammy Swindell as we watch him charge into that corner, sawing on that wheel, down the front straightaway. Kinzer into the third spot in that 
over number 11 automobile. But Kenzer does not seem to be able to pick up on the blue number 10 car, the fourth out automobile of Bobby Davis Jr. He's not making any ground up at all this early in the race anyway. Well, I think he may have been right when he told you, Steve, that that's an old beater of a race car, and he's doing a super job even to stay up with those uh, very rapid automobiles, the four, number 10 of Bobby Davis Jr., and the leader, num the black number two of Sammy Swindell, a brand new automobile. Well, let's check in about the middle of the pack. That 56 car, the red machine, that is Danny Smith. Just behind him, one next Eddie Gallagher, who's at the sixth spot. Eddie Hilliker gets seventh and challenging with the number two machine. All right, Dave Blaney in the 48 is blown past Danny Hilliker in the black two to take over that seventh spot and now begins to move in on the number one car of Eddie Gallagher to challenge for the sixth spot. So down the back straightaway. Oh, look at that. The 48 car of Blaney got sideways right in the middle of the back straightaway and slowed up a little bit, giving Gallagher a shot and holding on to that sixth position. So here comes Gallagher, and we've got a yellow flag. Yes, we do. Up against the wall, the orange number three car of Greg Hodnett. He's got a flat left rear tire, among other things. It'll take a while for the wreckers to get out there and rescue him. We'll take this break. Stay with us for the restart of the A-Main. I'm Brock Gates along with Steve Evans, and right now the Tennessee Clash is under caution as the crews clear away the slightly damaged automobile of Greg Hodnett. And Steve Evans, very little has actually changed in the leaderboard since the green flag fell. Swindell, Davis, Kinzer, and Ward are in the top four. That's exactly how they started. The green flag is already out, and they're only on the back stretch. And look at Sammy Swindell. What a jump he got on the field. I was hoping we'd see a, a little bit of a drag race between that man with his Ford and Swindell with the Chevy to get a comparison of the power. But Swindell was off the power so quick we didn't have it. Right. There you watch Bobby Davis Jr. in the blue tent coming down the back straightaway trying to make up that lost ground. And there's Danny Smith with the red 56. We got a terrific restart and jump by both Kinzer and Ward to take over that third spot. There is Kinzer who has fallen back a little bit, Steve. He's now in fifth spot being challenged by uh, Eddie Gallagher and the white number one. So something appears to be amiss in uh, Steve Kinzer's automobile. He just isn't running like he was. No, uh, this is not the picture perfect drive you expect from Steve Kinzer. We've been spoiled, I guess, over the years. There's something going on there. Right, Eddie Gallagher has now moved right past him into that uh, fifth position. So Eddie Gallagher running well. Look at this. Bobby Davis Jr. down the back straightaway is waving to his crew. He's slowing up. He is so going to bring that car into the pit, Brock, and they're going to put out a yellow because he is slowing there on the racetrack. So the yellow flag has come out. The 10 car coming into the pit area. He knows what's wrong. The crew waiting to try to find out themselves. Well, the, the car is uh, apparently under no power at this point. No smoke, no sign of any engine blowing. Uh, the tires are all up uh, and in good shape. So he's either broke something in the chassis or else he's got some serious engine problems. He is now, oh, he's frantic. Sitting on the uh, entrance of the pits at uh, right off turn number four. Here comes his crew. He's, he's out of fuel, Buck. Too many cautions. He must have started with a light load. They are trying now to get him pushed into a position where they can put a can of methanol in that race car to get him underway again. Well, Brock, as you say, they're so weight conscious with these machines and the light of the car, the quicker it is. They'll run just enough methanol, alcohol in that tank to what they figure it'll take to run the necessary laps. But there have been so many cops. Look at this. They're going to red flag this race and let everybody put fuel in the car. If Bobby Davis Jr. is short on fuel or out of fuel in his case, then everybody else has just about got to be too. Well, that seems to be a fair way to go about doing it as everybody comes to a stop and their crews will load them up with methanol. And now let's go to Steve with Bobby Davis Jr. The crew here of the number 10 car, Bobby Davis Jr., trying to calm him down really before he goes back out on the racetrack because World of Outlaw officials have said that he and the 17 car, Chris Each, must start at the back of the pack because they apparently caused a caution uh, before that red came out. So there was an infraction before the race was stopped for fuel, essentially. And, uh, well, Bobby Davis Jr., for one, is not a happy man. And, Steve, this is the other victim of that uh, early stop. Chris Eish is going to have to start also at the back of the field along with the number 10 car, Bobby Davis Jr. So these two men uh, ran out of fuel a little bit earlier. Fuel mileage suffered for them more than everybody else. So Chris Eish and problems uh, after running up uh, mid-pack uh, before the start, uh, restart. 
One man who may have gotten a break here is Steve Kinzer in the number 11 car. The problem he was suffering out there is that the car was jumping out of gear. He was having to hold the in and out transmission to keep the power connected to the rear wheels. They had, I believe, been able to fix that. Kinzer pushes off for the restart of the A feature. We'll be back. It should be a great one. Well, we're back underway again here at the Tennessee Clash. Uh, Swindell still leads it after everybody stopped, you'll recall, to load up with fuel. There were just enough cautions here in the early stages of this race. So everybody was running out, so they stopped them all, and now we're going to get a restart, Steve Evans. Well, Brock, there's a little mild protest, it would appear, going on here as number 10, Bobby Davis Jr. and 17E Chris Eish don't want to go to the back. But there is Outlaws Competition Director Bobby Watson saying, gentlemen, go to the back of the pack. And Davis, well, you can see the head shake there. He is still not a happy man. Well, it's, uh, it's an interesting call because both he and Ish uh, had uh, the same problem virtually that everybody else had. They had to stop a little bit earlier. And uh, there will be an argument, I'm sure, over whether or not they should be penalized as opposed to everybody else. Well, the rule says if you bring out the caution, you go to the back. You can see Bobby Davis Jr. is now complying with that. It's not the very back. Any cars that were last will be behind him, but it's close enough. Well, considering the fact that he was sitting in second spot, uh, right behind leader Sammy Swindell and uh, holding on to a very strong position in this race and uh, had a good chance to win it. Now he's going to have to uh, work his way all the way back, basically all the way back up among the leaders and trying to face off against uh, Sammy Swindell who broke the track record and is running like a rocket. It's going to be very difficult for him. Well, we saw Bobby Watson again trying to get this field lined up the way he feels they ought to be and he is the boss and considered one of the best in dirt track racing official them. It'll be a controversy, though. There'll be some talk about this after this race is over. We've got a green on the back straightaway. Sammy Swindell, one more perfect restart as he blasts out in front of everybody. Behind him, Danny Smith seems to have taken a hold of second place. But there's Mud Ford into the fence on the inside of the track. An awful crash because the 61 had four cars into a Bobby Davis Jr. also involved. Also, it is number 23, Greg Woolley, Chris Eish, number 17, E is involved in this thing. And as far as Mike Ward was concerned, the tag he took on the inside wall wasn't that bad. He came across the racetrack. It was getting T-boned that has done the severe damage here. This is a serious, serious accident. Oh, it absolutely is, Steve. Uh, Mike Ward tumbled down the front straightaway, upside down a couple of times before being tagged by Bobby Davis Jr. And of course, the Davis crews, there are more cars upside down in the foreground. We can identify the 2H or Rich Fubeck, otherwise we can't tell who's involved. Now watch the fifth car in this picture. He comes down and hits Mike Ward. That forces Mike to the left. He takes a brutal shot on the inside retaining wall, but now his troubles really begin. Hard to believe a 1,250 pound car could get this high in the air. The wing is of no use here because he never really gets upside down. Now you'll see, coming into the picture, the number 10 car, Bobby Davis Jr. He could not possibly avoid Mike Ward. When Davis got on the brakes, he was rear-ended by the red 29 car. You see on the left, that is Jim Bowden. But there was more damage than just that quartet. Mike Ward continued to take a beating. Uh, he's the one that uh, was hit the hardest and the one we're most concerned about at this particular moment, he and Bobby Davis Jr. Let's take one more look at it as we watch Ward tumbling down the front straightaway towards turn number one. This cluster of cars coming right in behind him. There's the 29 car getting up on top of the 10 car of Bobby Davis Jr. That's Jim Bowden. And once more impacted is the 61 car of Mike Ward. And finally, Chris Eish in the 17E uh, crashes into the whole lot. A really rugged collision. And let's hope everybody walks away all right. Notice, too, on the left side of your screen that four other cars are also tangled up. That's Bubeck, Kenny Conrad, Greg Hodden, and Greg Woolley. They are not as seriously damaged. Now, here is an extraordinary view of this crash. Here is Bobby Davis Jr. trying to slow down and is hit from the rear by Jim Bowden. Terrific impact. But now, let's go down to Steve at the scene of the crash. Well, Brock, you hear the roar of the crowd behind me? It's because Mike Ward of Memphis, Tennessee is crawling up of this demolished sprint car. He was unconscious momentarily. They had put a neck brace on him. They were lifting him out. He came to grab the neck brace, threw it away. Oh, these men are so very, very tough. He's obviously shaken. 
Uh, and I'm sure he'll go to the hospital. But as you can see, he's moving under his own power. Right now, let's go to Brock with Bobby Davis Jr. Well, Steve, I'm probably with the most disappointed young man in the place right now. Bobby Davis Jr., of course, uh, back at the back of the field after running in second spot, then involved in that crash. I guess most of, important of all, though, Bobby, uh, are you all right? Oh, sure. I'm okay. You know, that number 10 car is real safe, and uh, I just hope all the other drivers are okay. Uh, everybody seems to be all right. Exactly what happened? Uh, I know you were trying to run up through the field, obviously, to get back. Well, like when we was riding around there, uh, this Memphis racetrack has got a problem with the drain in on the front straightaway, and the water just runs down on the front straightaway. Well, the guys uh, that started in front of me, you know, they tried to run on the top of the racetrack, and Mike... He got loose real bad in the water and turned the car completely sideways. And some reason, it just took a, a left right into the fence way in front of me. And he was flipping way up in the air, and I was trying to dodge him. And then uh, I was done slow down and everything. And I guess the guys behind me never even seen him or, or nothing. And they just started hitting me, and I hit Mike, and it just kept on like a chain reaction. Wow. Unfortunately, it's what happens in this kind of competition every once in a while. The most important thing is that you're all right. We know you'll come back and get up front again. but. Uh, once again, we're sorry you're out. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, Brock, good to see that Bobby Davis Jr. is indeed okay. His number 10 sprinter, well, it's a pretty tough old girl itself. It'll be repaired and race again. Stick with us. We'll be back with a restart of the A-Main. Believe it or not, heavy rains that hit the Memphis area may have in their own way contributed to the crash that we just saw involving Ward and Bobby Davis Jr. and others. Steve, file this report on that problem. We've talked about the tremendous rains that came through here last night. Well, their effect is still being felt. And that is what Bobby Davis Jr. was talking about. There's places on the racetrack, like right there, coming out of turn one or a bit before the start-finish line, that are damp. And they get damp during caution flags when there's not enough friction from the tires to keep it dry. And also, of course, during that long red stop, the fuel stop. Now, the officials here have sprinkled down there and in other places a white chemical powder. It's called potassium chloride. And they hope that that will dry that up and prevent another incident from happening because of the water that is weeping out of those drains. All right, the field is now single file getting formed up for a restart here. Sammy Swindell continues to lead it. Danny Smith, Eddie Gallagher, one of the local guys, running in third spot. Kinzer having fallen back from uh, uh, third place down to fourth, sits there, ready to go for a restart. They're on the gas on the back straightaway. And Sammy Swindell is gone like a rocket. It should be interesting here now, Bob, to watch the 11 car, though, of Steve Kinzer, now that they've got that in-and-out box problem fixed, and he can drive with both hands. Right. Eddie Gallagher challenging and taking second spot from Danny Smith that goes way high in the 56. And look at Kinzer drive underneath a boat. A fantastic pass by Steve Kinzer. But Eddie Gallagher comes right back at him, try on the low side to get back into that second spot. And here's the red car of Danny Smith, the 56 machine down low, and he takes the third position away from 1X and a Gallagher. And that is sprint car racing at its best. Every lap is an improvisation by these drivers. There's no perfect line around here. You just take the best way you can find. Now Danny Smith high, Gallagher low, but Smith seems to have taken hold of that position as Gallagher falls back a little bit. So Smith in third, up in front of him is Steve Kinzer and Sammy Swindell. And you want to see an artist at work? There he is, Sammy Swindell, the master of his machine tonight. What a brilliant job he's done in front of the hometown fans. Well, he's just been absolutely unchallenged on every lap he's run, including his qualifying lap. He has dominated here tonight, and uh, of course, being from just outside Memphis at Butler, Tennessee, he is terribly popular here. Let's take a look at how big a lead he actually has. There is Sammy Swindell. He is in the lead. Just exited your picture. And there is the second place driver, the number 11 car of Steve Kenzer. The way it's going right now, Swindell's motor would have to fall out of his car for Kenzer to catch him. Oh, yeah. This is like uh, five laps in a super speedway race. Uh, these cars are so closely matched that uh, half a straightaway league is uh, almost impossible to get. As we've got the final lap coming up, Sammy Swindell, there is Steve Kisser, almost hopeless uh, job ahead of him to try to run down this man who can almost coast him as he slides into turn number three, off turn number four. Ahead of him lies the checkered flag and victory in the Tennessee class. And even in the final lap, Sammy Swindell putting on a show for the band. There is Steve Kinzer finishing number two. Swindell got it a little more sideways than 
maybe he needed to practice in case anybody was taking a picture. Well, you can be sure a bunch of folks in the stands used up their flash balls tonight because it was a great show on the part of the local favorite, Sammy Swindell. There they are. Folks cheering them on. Swindell, Steve Kinzer, Danny Smith, Eddie Gallagher, the local guy, and Jeff Swindell, Sammy's brother, moves into the fifth spot at the end. Rounding out the top ten, interesting, Chris Eish and Greg Woolley, both of them who were involved in that crash, recover to finish seventh and tenth. And now let's go to Steve with the winner. Well, in a race full of bizarre events, only one thing remained constant, and that was this man, Sammy Swindell, who led every lap. Congratulations, Sam. It was a tough night's work. Yeah, it was pretty long. Uh, yeah, it's like, I don't know, maybe they'll call this uh, 24 hours of Memphis or something. It's <laughs> An endurance race. You know, when you would hit those wet spots where the drains were weeping water down on the track, you could hear the engine RPM come up as the rear tires were spinning. Yeah, it got real bad when we'd have the reds. You know, the water would run out, and, you know, there wasn't anybody out there to keep it packed in and uh it got pretty bad you know on some of the starts and uh, uh there was one time i thought it was good enough up there i moved up and well, i about lost it <laughs> well a crowd pleasing victory certainly for sammy swindell again our congratulations okay thanks okay let's go to brock yates with steve kenzer uh, steve first of all congratulations on once again winning the world of outlaws championship i think that may be the the most important accomplishment for you tonight well, that was our main thing was uh, just to get here. And uh, like I said, we left uh, all of our equipment out west. And I tell you what, uh, I don't know if that thing wouldn't have had uh, problems with the, uh, the gear shift. I think we was going to put a race on him. Uh, we was right there. And uh, anytime you uh, give Sammy a wide open track with six laps to go, there's not much chance for you. But uh, I tell you what, pretty proud of that three-year-old car. She looked pretty good. Well, you're always in it. Our congratulations once again uh, on another championship and a great, great drive. Well, tonight in Memphis, the Outlaws put on the dirt track equivalent of a bar room brawl. For Brock Yates, I'm Steve Evans. So long from Memphis International Motorsports Park and the World of Outlaw Sprint Car Competition. The executive producer for American Sports Cavalcade is Harvey M. Pallish. Produced and directed by John B. Mullen. Promotional consideration provided for and a fee paid by the Style Auto World Championship Team. The nation's premier source of fast lane fashions. Style Auto, the champion's choice for the style of your life. The American Sports Cavalcade is a presentation of Diamond Bee Sports.